Good evening. Good evening. Hey, we're going to talk about Nehemiah tonight. Do a little character study of one of the, the great servants of God in the Old Testament. Someone that we, we may not think about uh, as being as great maybe as a Daniel or an Abraham or whomever. But along with Ezra, uh, two books in the Old Testament, historical books, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah give historical accounts of the rebuilding of the temple and of the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. Remember, by the time of 586 B.C., 585, right around in there, Babylonians destroyed the city and the temple and took people, took them to Babylon. And that's where you meet Many of the characters, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, talks about uh, Sennacherib, I don't, not so much Sennacherib there, but ne Neb Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus and, and such. And you get into this time period as, as the children of Israel have been allowed to go back to Jerusalem, first of all, to rebuild the temple and reestablish uh, uh, Yahweh worship in Jerusalem. But uh, then Nehemiah is just a little bit after this, and he goes back to rebuild the city. But uh, as we look at it, and you see what I've got up there, two things that were needed for all of this to take place and, and for there to be a good work done, the people had to confess their wrong and repent. Now remember, it's 50 years has passed, so... Uh, many of that older generation have died, but the ones who were involved in idolatry, there were a few of them who were still living at that time. So, uh, and I think it, you remember what I talked about Daniel not too long ago, and, and when Daniel prayed, uh, one of the things he prayed for his sins and for the sins of his people, the nation. And that was why God allowed them to be destroyed, even though they had the temple in Jerusalem, they had the priesthood, and they had the law. They, they got involved in idolatry. So God took them away, but they had to realize that. And they did realize it to the point where they never did fall into idolatry again. But they had a lot of other problems going on down through their history, even down to the time of Jesus' first coming. So... Uh, confession and repentance it's going to be the same thing for us isn't it if, if, if we expect to get out of this world alive if we expect to be doing God's work and for God to be putting his fullest effort in, with us then we have to have a con constant confession and repentance of our sins and the sins of the nation the community around us uh, we've got to be priests to the community each and every one of us and one of the things that priests do is pray. Pray. It's one of the best things we can do. Secondly, they had to develop leaders. They had to develop spiritual leaders, leaders who would obey God without contradiction. In other words, when God said, do something, they said, we're going to do it. And when God didn't say something, there was the warning, hey, don't, don't. We don't want to offend our God. So Ezra and Nehemiah, another man by the name of Haggai was instrumental in all of this. These were the men who led God's people back to true worship and service to God. But we want to look at Nehemiah tonight and look at seven points from his life that show him to be a servant of God and a leader of God's people. Uh, look at the first one. Right there it is, right? Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He's the man of prayer. Not at the time God called him. Not after he started the work, before the work was even started. Because he had a, a heart that was broken because there he was in Babylon and he was serving the king, the emperor, uh, in a very important position. But he wasn't happy with that because Jerusalem was still laying in ruins. Uh, people would go, come back from Jerusalem, and he would ask them, hey, how, what's it like in Jerusalem? Oh, you know, they got the temple kind of built. It's not anyways near what it was, but the city's still in ruins. You know, something's going on. It took them 15 years to get the temple 
built after they cleared the uh, the foundation. They just stopped the work. Finally got that done, but now, you know, the city's still in ruins. Uh, it, it needs to be updated. It needs to become a beautiful city again. So, uh, Nehemiah, when the king sees that he's in a distressed condition, he's kind of depressed because of what's happening back in his homeland, the king said to me, Nehemiah writes, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Before he just blurted it out, he prayed to God. God, you know, let this be accepted. God, you know, this is for you. I want to I want to do something for you. And he wants to make sure that when he talks to the king about rebuilding a city that that uh, a predecessor empire had destroyed, he wants to make sure that uh, it's going to be all right. He's going to have God's intervention he wants God's providence to go before him to kind of pave the way because the, the emperor, the king, knows something's wrong. Nehemiah just, you know, something something just isn't right. He's not the, the type of person he was. He, he's got something on his mind. What's on your mind, Nehemiah? Before he answers, he prays to make sure he gets it all right. And that's, that's what James tells us, isn't it? James 1, 6, but let him ask in faith, not doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. We don't want to be driven and tossed by the wind, do we? We want to have solid foundation. We want to know that where we're standing, that we're standing on the foundation of God's word, God's promises, God's sacrifice for us. We want to make sure that we're right and in Sometimes that takes a little forethought, and that takes the, the prayer of making sure, God, know what's in my heart, and if my heart's not right, help me to change it. Uh, we can't pray for something and expect to receive it unless we put forth an effort to receive it. The old standard, right? We need to pray like everything depends upon God and work like everything depends upon us. That way, you know, that that's only fair, isn't it? If we expect God to be helping us, then we need to be doing something. Just don't throw all the whole burden on him. So we cannot pray for a justice to be accomplished in this world unless we're willing to stand up for what's right. You understand what I'm saying? There's a lot of people here, oh, it's terrible what's happening here or there or whatever, but, you know, I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm not going to try to teach anybody and surely I'm not going to tell anybody that they're wrong. You, know, you can tell somebody that they're a sinner and that, it doesn't matter to them. They're, they're kind of proud of about that. But tell somebody that they're wrong. Well, who do you think you are telling me I'm wrong? You know? Well, it's not so much that we're telling them they're wrong. So, hey, you need to look at which direction you're headed here. Or are you headed in a direction where there's going to be good things happen? This doesn't even have to be in terms of salvation. Just in terms of living in this world, is that going to be good or is that going to get you into deeper trouble? You need to, to take a little bit of an effort here and, and just see where you're headed with this. So Nehemiah was a man of prayer and, you know, if we're going to be leaders of God's people, we need to be people of prayer also. If we're going to make a difference in this world, then we need to be people of prayer. Nehemiah was a man of purpose. Look at verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. But notice, I went to Jerusalem. He just said, oh, Lord, I wish, or to, to God and then to the king, I wish Jerusalem could be rebuilt and become a beautiful city again. He went there. He went there. He didn't want somebody else to do it. He's going to get help, but, but he wanted to be there. He wanted to be a part of it. So he goes there. And listen, it says he waits three days. He was there three days. You know what he was doing in three days? Looking around. He just didn't get there and jump off the camel and say, All right, let's get to work. He looked around. He found out what was going on. He found out who was running the town. Who was there? Who, could, who would he need to talk to? 
you know, we move frequently and <laughs> we go uptown and have to ask, you know, where's the license bureau? Where do we get the utilities turned on? You know, need to know all those things before you, you get too involved. So there he is. He's finding out what he needs to know. And, and a lot of it, you need to find out who you can trust. Because you just can't trust everybody. You find out who you can trust, and then you build the relationships on the foundation of trust. He wanted to see who wanted Jerusalem rebuilt also. So he found out who was on God's side, who was on who was not on God's side, I'll put it that way, and, and how he could get this work accomplished. He developed a plan, so that's, that's his man of purpose. Do we have a plan? You know, I like that in uh, uh, Red uh, yeah, Hunt for Red October, uh, where the submarine commander's talking, you know, what's, what's the Russian going to do? And a uh, Russian a Russian submarine commander doesn't go to the bathroom without a plan. <laughs> That's life, isn't it? Plan, you know, just you, you fly by the seat of your pants, you know, you got to have some idea what you want to accomplish. Well, God gives us tasks for what he wants us to accomplish in the church. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 through 16 with all, here's how you do it, with all humility and gentle spirit in the bond of peace. Now, that's how you do it, but what do you do? Well, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope uh, that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does that mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended. And I lost my place when I... Okay. Far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, here he gets to the task that he left to human beings. Uh, he, appoint, or he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way and into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Nehemiah is talking about building a city. He had to go find out, what do I need to do to, to rebuild this city? Who do I need to see? Who do I need to get on to my, my side? Who do I need to watch out for that's going to stand in the way? And the same thing happens with the church. See, see, we've got this task to build the church, and we don't want to be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. We want to be knowledgeable. We want to have a purpose, understand our purpose, and then go out and fulfill that purpose. So again, ministry in, in, in the passage here in, in Ephesians chapter 4, you know, the big thing in that, that's just not preachers. That's each and every one of us. We're each servants. We're each ministers. We're each priests of God as the children of God. Nehemiah was a man of persistence. Persistence. My wife says I'm very persistent. I just don't listen 
at all. <laughs> Never, you know. <laughs> it's, yeah. But nobody likes a quitter, right? I keep on. Because nobody likes a quitter. You, you, now, now you got it. Now you got it. <laughs> So he, but he was persistent. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. It wasn't only uh, Nehemiah who had to have a mind and a purpose, you know, to get this, this is what I want to do, and we're going to do it, but he had to have the persistence to put up with people who, for so many years, just really didn't care about. What they what they were building, or you know, didn't mind if it looked like slums downtown. You know, uh, it's all right. Well, again, persistence. Got to keep at it. Got to remember what our purpose is, and and every day that goes by, we're remembering what that purpose is, and we're keeping going forward. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-11 through 11. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter. Okay, second Peter. I agree. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, I just left off the two in front of Peter. <laughs> uh, what happens? Well, you I'm said sorry. first Peter. Then... I'll repent. <laughs> I think you said first Peter, but that's all right. Yeah, I'm I, I, I might have. Just but it is second Peter. Uh, but, but see, if, if we're not growing, if we're not, if we don't have this purpose and we're persistent in this purpose to get stronger every day, say, then, then we're going to be in trouble. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent, that's that persistence, isn't it? Be diligent, uh... to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail, or never fall. For in this way there will be, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There goes that, that, that deal again, you know, okay, I, hey, I believed and I was baptized, so I'm okay. No, you got the call and you got the election, but now you got to live a life that you're confirming it, you know. Every now and then you, you make an appointment at the doctor's office, right? And, you know, it's for six months away and about... Uh, two or three days before your your office visit, uh, they call you up. We want to confirm your appointment. Make sure you're going to be here. Yeah, well, that's what God is doing with us throughout our lives. He, he's calling us up kind of and saying, I want you to confirm that you're here. Well, how do I do that? Well, by adding these things to my life. And and, and continuing to grow. That's how we confirm that calling, that election, that was our new birth. So persistence, yeah. We need to be a persistent people. Know what we're going to do, and then be persistent in pursuing it. Nehemiah was a man of perseverance. What's the difference between perseverance and persistence? Well, perseverance goes with some trials and tribulations, I believe. Mm, excuse me trials and tribulations, when people want to stop you from your purpose, and when people don't like your persistence, then they're going to give you some hassle, and you got to persevere through that. you just got to keep on moving in spite. You know, if the whole world's against you, you still got to be on God's side. I'm going to keep going, Charlie. <laughs> okay? Uh, Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 3, And I sent messengers to them, 
these are the people who are trying to get Nehemiah to stop the work, saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Yeah. Stop building, rebuilding the city. Stop building the wall. And if they built the wall, they'd have some protection from their enemies. The enemies say, you know, don't make it harder for us to rule over you. You know, stop it. He's, well, we'll just stop for a little bit and come down and talk to us. Of course, they were going to try to take Nehemiah and kill him at that time. But see, he had to overcome that. And the way he overcome it was, you know, hey, I'm doing a great work here. I don't need to stop and come down there. You know, when the work's done, then we might sit down and talk. But it'll be on my terms. Uh, so, yeah, perseverance. Don't let people stop you. And, and don't let yourself stop you. Amen. Sometimes our, by, by our own selves, we just, we kind of give up. We, we, we think it's too hard. You know, nobody's saying it's easy, but it's not that hard. You know, the hard part's the decision to remain faithful. That's it. So, Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. For in him, that's in Christ, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of the flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless, and above reproach before him. Remember we talked about the judgment day? And after Judgment Day, he takes his kingdom and turns it over to the Father. What does he want to do? What does he want his kingdom to be like? He wants to present us holy and blameless and above reproach. He's going to do that, whether we're a part of that group or not. He's going to do it. So we may as well choose to be a part of that group, right? We may as well Amen. have the purpose, have the, the uh, persistence, and then persevere through it, keep growing, so that we do this. And, and listen to the last part of this. If indeed you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. But there it is. Not tossed to and fro, whatever, you hear something. Oh, that sounds pretty good. I think I'll try that. And, you know, I once tried out at a congregation where they, they were talking about the preacher that they'd had before. You know, he'd go down to the Tulsa workshop or he'd go to this lectureship here, he'd go over here, and he'd hear something. He'd come back and say, we need to try this. And uh, they'd get started and he'd go off to another lectureship or something. He'd come back, we need to try this. They never really did follow through on anything that they started to see if it works. You just don't start something in the church and expect it to, to uh, flourish and be productive and be able to continue with it in a short period of time. Sometimes it takes two, three years of the planning and, and, and going through things and saying, let's see this through. You know, if it doesn't work in a year or two years, maybe, you know, but let's see, let's see how it's going to go. Well, that's the type of people we need to be, and, and don't let people stop us from doing good, surely. All right, Nehemiah was a man of perfection. And when I say perfection, I'm not talking about he never sinned. I'm talking about a man who completed things. He got things done. How did he get things done? He had a purpose, he was persistent, and he persevered overcoming these problems so that he could complete things. He, uh, Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. It took him 52 days to build the wall around Jerusalem. I don't know for sure just how much that was. It was a lot of work that had to be accomplished. 52 days. Well, there was a bridge that fell down somewhere, I think in Atlanta, Georgia, or somewhere on Interstate Highway. I don't think they even got it all cleaned up yet, you know. Uh, and it's been a, a long time. It, it, 
Uh, thanks today, you know, it takes forever to get anything done when you're talking about a government project. They did this in 52 days. But why? Because of the type of leaders that they had, but then the people had a mind to work. And, and remember, there were times when they had uh, a, a, a mortar trial in one hand and a sword in the other hand because of the attacks of the enemy. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Again, yes, our heavenly Father is perfect. He's never sinned. But that's not really what it's talking about. It's talking about us being spiritually mature. Spiritually mature. In other words, we're able, we could stand before God. We could have a conversation with God. Like Jesus had the conversation with the doctors and the lawyers in the temple when he was 12 years old. Okay, He was spiritually mature at that age. That doesn't mean he was teaching. That just means as they talk, he can carry on a conversation with them about those topics. And that's what God wants for us to do. Now, now how do I know that? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. Until we attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Being like him. Being able to do that, being able to talk about spiritual things, being able to relate things, being able to take a, a common situation out here that we may run into every day, day-to-day -day basis, and be able to take that and use as an example of something that is heavenly. Uh, like the parables that Jesus taught. He took the everyday things and he made a, a heavenly, uh, it was an earthly story, but it had a heavenly meaning and it, it Show people how easy it is to understand the Word of God. Uh, Nehemiah was a man of personality. Nehemiah 5.15 The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and, I, and took from them for their daily ration forty shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. You say, well, what's that, what's that got to do with personality? Well, you look at it. Here, here's a leader who wasn't there to feed off the sheep. He was there to support the sheep. And, and even the servants of the governors before would go out and oppress the poor people. Instead of building them up. Instead of giving them hope. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, that it is good and acceptable and perfect. By changing our minds, we begin to change everything about us. And I'm talking about that when I'm talking about personality. When we change our minds from the, the what can I get out of people to the attitude of what can I do for people? How can I help people? How can I help? How can I serve? That different attitude changes us into the attitude that Jesus had and the attitude that the personality of a man like Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was a man of power. Power. And it, it's hard to, to really grasp that because he seems so humble and he's, he's determined, but he, he's not strong-arming anybody. He's not twisting their arms to get them to do stuff. But he's still a man of power. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8, they read from the book the law of God clearly and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading there's where the power of the gospel is and that's really where the power of a preacher of God's word is it's not simply standing up and telling people what they need to do it's explaining to people what they need to do so that they understand it so they can make the choice themselves to do it that's, that's what a leader is. Uh, a leader is someone who's out in front and leading, saying, hey, let's, let's go this way. 
Uh, it's not driving people to do things, to do what the individual wants. See, the Apostle Paul was a man just like this. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. He said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for, it is, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. But the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And there are a lot of people out here, a lot of churches, okay, put it in quotation marks so we're not misunderstanding, that they, they want to baptize people, but there's no power in it. There's no power in the gospel. They, they, they just tell people what to do. Do this, do this, do this. And people don't understand this. Well, that's just what my preacher said to do, or that's what my church says to do, or that's what the creed says to do. But they're not doing it because they've had a change of heart and now knowing what to do to be right with God, they simply leave it in the hands of other people. So the great power that was there he convinced them that this was a work that needed to be done, and he got them on the same page. Whether it's it's prayer, or purpose, or persistence, or perseverance, and all, all those P's that we've been talking about, that's where the power was for Nehemiah. And that's where the power will be for us. If the church is going to survive in any community, two things are needful. Okay, right back to where we started from, okay? As God's people, we must connect. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. You know, we talk about that every now and then, especially verse 7, walk in the light as he is in the light. But we also have to become leaders. Leaders who obey God without contradiction. Leaders who are going in the right way, inviting others to come along with us. Because the journey's worth taking. It's worth, ta it's worth taking others with us for sure. Exodus chapter 23, verse 22. But if you carefully obey the voice of the Lord and do all that, that... I'm sorry. Let me go back and start again. This is Moses speaking. Or I'm, I'm sorry, it's God speaking. But if you will carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Hey, I can turn everything over to God then, can't I? If he's going to take care of my adversaries, if he's going to take care of my enemies, I don't have to do it. He'll take care of it. What a wonderful thing. Well, Nehemiah exemplifies, exemplifies the qualities and activities of servants and leaders who find God's approval. And I think that's what we want too. I think that's what we want. And, and we're searching for that. We're, we're wanting that. So you know, here's just a good example of the type of people that, that we not only can be, but that we ought to be. Hey, thank you for your time. The lesson is yours. If you have a need, let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation song.